I therefore by these presents give public notice that I will employ 10 men in addition to those employed by the government to act as rangers for the common defense. When Stephen F. Austin wrote these words in 1823, the term ranger was not a new term. As early as 1622, this term was being used in Europe for those who ranged over the land to protect it. The term was brought over to America and used in both the Northeast as well as in Georgia to name the men who were not military soldiers in uniform, but a group that dressed as normal people yet protected the frontiers from incursions by both hostile Indians as well as bandits and other enemies, no matter who they were. Little did Austin realize how badly his colony would need the protection of these 10 men, as well as the many who would come after them, to help protect it. Austin's colony was situated in the middle of Indian country, and the night brought dangers, but with the full moon, a more menacing danger soon made itself known. The Kichais, Wacos, and other hostile tribes made themselves known to the colonists by raiding and killing. But yet, the closest Indians, being the Karankawas, would not be the fiercest that these colonists would meet. Ground and infantry tactics like those used by Morrison and the original 10 Rangers worked well against the tribes along the coastal plains of Texas. As Morrison went south towards the coast to establish a blockhouse for protection, what he and his men had were nine rifles and one musket, and a total of 162 balls and charges of powder. While most of them had horses, most fighters of the day, both Indian and white, acted as dismounted cavalry. They rode to where the enemy was and then fought on foot. But this was soon to change. Over time, the rangers with their horses were able to range farther and farther out onto the plains. But they had no tactics for fighting from a horse. They would just ride to the fight and then get off and fight. But what they discovered as they ranged further west was a group of Indians that was invading from the north. And this group of Indians did have tactics for fighting from a horse. They were better on a horse and better living off the land than anyone the rangers had faced yet. While their weapons may have been primitive by the standards of the day, their skill at using them and the tactics they employed made them the best in the world. These were the Comanche. Most Comanche lances were between 10 and 14 feet long. The blades were between 10 and 14 inches long. The Comanche learned to use the lance by watching and fighting the Spanish. This was the same places where they got their horses. The lance was carried on horseback and used under the arm and would impale an enemy from a full run as they rode past. In the Battle of Walker Creek, both Samuel Walker as well as Ed Gillespie were lanced through the body and almost died. A lance was decorated with scalp locks, feathers, and other things that would move and dance as the warrior was holding it and rode his horse. The Comanche carried their bow and a quiver of arrows loose and low slung so they could be shifted easily from one side of their body to the other. The average Comanche bow was about 48 inches long, normally made of bodark. A Comanche warrior was very skilled with a bow. He could fire it from horseback at a full run. A good Comanche could fire a second arrow before the first one hit its target. They were masters of horsemanship. Comanche would normally grasp the arrow in what was called a tertiary grip, 
which use the thumb and third finger to hold the knock over the string, pulling the string and arrow back and then releasing it. It is very quick and very accurate. Normally, they would shoot it at an angle. A Comanche warrior could hang down off the side of his horse's body and could fire their arrows from underneath the horse's neck as they rode. They could also lay back across the horse and shoot from that position also. Arrows were made of hickory and dogwood, cherry, or other hardwoods. The tips of most arrows by the mid-1700s were made of metal. The points on these arrows were made of barrel hoops. Barrel hoops were a popular item to use as the thickness was just right for the arrowheads. The fletching on the arrows was normally from a turkey or from another large bird. The Comanche also had a shield made of leather from the neck of the buffalo. It was round and convex in shape. It was made of two layers, and between the layers of the shield, they would stuff paper and other items so tightly that the shield became stiff enough and tough enough to reflect a lead ball fired from a gun. The first true cavalry was the Comanche, as they executed primary combat functions from horseback. American Dragoons and early Rangers fought as dismounted cavalry. It was not until the technology of the revolver was introduced could the Rangers and eventually the entire U.S. cavalry fight as true cavalry and therefore on an even keel with the Comanches. Noah Smithwick, one of the earlier Rangers, stated that primitive as the Indian weapons were, they gave them an advantage over the old single-barreled muzzle-loading rifle in the manner of rapid shooting, an advantage which told heavily in a charge. An Indian could discharge a dozen arrows while a man was loading his gun, and if they managed to draw all their fire at once, well, they had us at their mercy, we, unless we had a safe retreat. The single-shot caplock rifle was the cutting edge in technology in the 1840s. While slow to load, its accuracy of these Ranger rifles were legendary. In the Battle of Arroyo Seco, it was the precision rifle fire that carried the day, along with what Ranger Brown emphasized how the Rangers fired in alternate platoons by which one-third of their guns were always loaded to meet the attack at close quarters. Introduced in the early 1820s, the advent of the percussion cap was a great improvement over the flintlock. A cap was placed over the nipple and had a hole in the center of it. This nipple replaced the flint and lock frizzen. The hammer was also replaced because it no longer needed to hold a flint. The good news was that this new system did not mean the entire gun had to be replaced. Only the lock itself, or possibly even the hammer and frizzen. This new ignition system was a great step forward and was much more reliable and weatherproof than the flintlock had ever been. The flintlock system had been in use since the early 1600s, but this new ignition system did not change the way or the manner in which the long gun or pistol was loaded or fired. The caps themselves were small cups of copper with fulminated mercury inside. While they could be carried loosely in the tins in which they came, most men carried them in a brass or leather capper. This capper held them in the correct position to be easily and quickly placed on the nipple. These cappers were usually hung from the shooting bag where they could be handy. Black powder was also carried in either horns or flasks and were attached to the shooting bag for ease. Powder measures were also close and handy. Only in Hollywood did someone actually pour black powder directly down the barrel of a weapon from a horn or a flask. These measures were made of either natural material such as horn or metal like brass. Wooden ball blocks were carried that contained four or more appropriate sized lead balls that were either greased or had a greased patch around it. The block was placed over the top of the barrel and the greased ball and patched ball was pushed down the barrel. 
together the capper, measure, and block were the speed loaders of the day. After firing his rifle, the ranger would take his horn and measure out a charge of powder and pour this down the barrel. A greased or patched round ball of the appropriate size could then be started down the barrel. The ramrod is used to seat the powder and ball all the way down against the breech. The ramrod is returned to its place because if your loading process was interrupted and you had to move, you would always need your ramrod. The capper then could be used to place a cap on the rifle, and the rifle fired a second time. This process was not fast. A good rifleman might be able to do it twice in a minute. It was designed to do standing up, but could be done laying down, but it was almost impossible to do on horseback. Yes, Rangers had pistols, but not in the numbers that you might expect. But even these pistols had the same technology and had to be loaded in the same way. If your enemy got too close to you before you could reload, your only options were to either run or go to the weapons that did not require reloading. For most rangers in most encounters, this meant that you fired your one shot and then ran for safety. This vulnerability was something the Indians counted on and watched for. So what might this vulnerability look like? As you can tell, it does not take long for our stand-in Comanche to let loose an entire string of arrows while the poor ranger just stood there being a target. Seeing that the rangers were usually outnumbered, well, I think you get the point. So with our rangers being represented by hay bales and the Indians being represented by balloons, this is the other view of what this vulnerability would look like. Yes, these rangers are in trouble. In 1836 in Texas, while the Battle of the Alamo was raging, and during the time of Sam Houston and the runaway scrape, a young man in Connecticut by the name of Samuel Colt had patented the first practical revolving pistol. Sam had gone to sea as a young man, and it was said that he got the idea for his revolving cylinder by studying the ship's steering mechanism. What Colt invented was a five-shot revolving pistol. It had a five-round rotating cylinder that was loaded from the front of the cylinder with approximately 22 grains of black powder, and then a 36 caliber ball pla placed over each chamber. A wad of grease was put over the end of each chamber to prevent all five rounds from going off when the first round was fired. Percussion caps were then placed over each of the five nipples at the rear of the cylinder. The entire procedure was not unlike loading a single shot pistol, but now you have five shots ready to go. To fire the gun, the hammer was cocked back, revealing a fold away trigger that came out of the bottom of the frame. When the trigger was pulled, the hammer fell, striking the cap and firing the gun. Cocking the hammer rotated the cylinder and brought up a freshly loaded chambered round under the cocked hammer. Reloading the Patterson was very time consuming and difficult at best. 
But once you had it loaded, it was like having five loaded guns. Seeing that the fastest reload in the 1840s was having another loaded gun, this quickly became the answer that they were looking for. Texas became the testing and proving ground for the new Colt pistol, as there was little interest in the East and the United States military did not see value of such an arm. In April of 1839, Texas's Secretary of the Navy, Hunt, authorized Captain Edward W. Moore, commander of the Navy, to purchase 180 Colt Patterson carbines and the same number of Patterson pistols with all the necessary accessories. So many of the number five or holster model Pattersons went to Texas that it was also referred to as the Texas Patterson. The Colt pistols came in the hands of the Rangers when the Texas Navy was disbanded in 1843. A man carrying a single Patterson with an extra cylinder was now the equal of five men with rifle and pistol. On January 23, 1844, the 8th Texas Congress realized the need for some protection on the frontier. So they passed an act authorizing John C. Hayes to raise a company of mounted gunmen or rangers to act on the western and southwestern frontier. In June of that year, Captain Hayes and approximately 14 men headed northwest out of San Antonio on a scout looking for Indians. Hayes, being familiar with the Patterson, had not just handed out this new tool to his rangers, but they had spent many days practicing, loading, and shooting, both from horseback as well as at stationary targets. As Hayes told his men, boys, keep up your practice shooting horseback. It beats the Indians at their own game. So what kind of changes could a man with a rifle and a Patterson make in an Indian fight? Well, let's see. Now, how would that change the bow and arrow comparison? Well, that is quite a difference. In June of 1844, Captain Hayes, along with Samuel Walker and his men, discovered some Indian tracks near a small creek near the city of where Sister Dale now stands. The rangers found the four Indians that made the tracks, and the two groups saw each other about the same time. The four Indians pretended to be scared and turned to run away from the rangers. However, Hayes was too old an old Indian fighter to fall for such a trap and he made no effort at pursuit. So when the Indians saw that the plan was not working, the four were joined by approximately 75 of their brothers. But what the Indians were not expecting was for Hayes and his rangers to attack. Hayes did not count on the odds of the predicament simply by the numbers of Indians versus the number of rangers, but what he looked at was the firepower that his rangers carried. The Indians rode up to the top of the knoll where they held a superior position above the rangers. Showing off their feathered line lances and round thick buffalo shields, the Indians taunted them in Spanish, telling the rangers to charge, charge. Well, to their surprise, that's exactly what Hayes and the rangers did. When the rangers came to the base of the hill and out of sight of the Indians, they rode around the knoll to a point behind the Indians and then started up the hill. By the time they were seen, the rangers were too close into the Indians and immediately fired their rifles. Then Hayes told his men to throw down your rifles. This surprised the Indians, and they rode forward attacking the rangers with their terrifying screams and legendary horsemanship. What the Indians expected was a single-shot pistol, 
But what they got was rangers with pistols that not only shot once, but shot again and again and again. 20 Comanches were killed within 15 minutes and many others wounded. The rangers, however, did not come out unscathed. It was quoted that scarcely a man in the little band that had not grazed by a spear or arrow. Their gun stocks, knife handles, and saddles perforated in many places. The battle turned into a running fight for a couple of miles. Hayes related that it was not until after the third round from their five shooters that the Indians gave way. But whenever they were pressed severely, they made the most desperate charges and efforts to defeat me. The Indians were down to about 35 men left, and the Rangers had almost exhausted their ammunition. An Indian chief had rallied his braves for one last charge, a charge that Hayes knew would completely leave his Rangers outnumbered and outgunned, with only their bowie knives left, and he knew there was not much chance for his troops. Hayes called out to see who had a loaded rifle. Richard Ad Gillespie rode forward and answered that he was so armed. Dismount and then shoot that chief was the order. At the distance of 30 steps, the ball had done its charge. In a wild affray at the loss of their leaders, the others scattered in every direction in the brushy woods. Due to his own wounded men, Hayes camped where the fight took place. The Patterson made the major difference in this battle, a fact that was not lost on Captain Hayes as he reported to the Texas Secretary of War and Marine. I then ordered a charge, and after discharging our rifles, closed in with them hand to hand with my five shooting pistols, which did good execution. Had it not been for them, I doubt what the consequences would have been. I cannot recommend these arms too highly. 23 Comanche and Mexicans lie dead on the ground, 30 wounded, most of them badly. Peter Foyer was the only ranger killed. Samuel Walker, Ad Gillespie, and W.D. Lee were seriously wounded. With the remainder of his patrol, Jack Hayes proceeded back to his camp near San Antonio. The full measure of his victory was not immediately apparent. He had taken on a force three times the number of his own, more importantly, he had defeated that force in a running fight from horseback and enabled his men for the first time to pursue and punish their defeated rivals. This had been possible almost entirely due to the adoption of a revolutionary new weapon which had never been used before in mass against an enemy. Colt made improvements to the original Patterson by adding a fixed loading lever an improvement that would be kept with future percussion Colt pistols. Sam Walker, who was wounded in the Walker Creek fight, would later meet with Colt, and together they would create the famous Walker Colt. This four-pound, 44-caliber giant would be the first revolver to give Colt what he really wanted, a contract with the U.S. military. Walker would make this pistol famous in the war with Mexico, a war in which Walker himself would die. Together, this new technology, the Patterson, as well as using the Comanche's own tactics against them, made the Rangers a force to be reckoned with. Thank you for having me to the uh, Texas Ranger Hall of Fame and Museum. It's an honor to be here. It's a privilege and it's very exciting. It's a be very beautiful place to say the least. When I go out in the world, if I'm in South America, Argentina, where I go a lot, where my wife is from, Europe, New York, San Francisco, wherever you name it, people will come up to me and say, 
Augustus McRae and Lonesome Dove. And I will say that was my favorite part ever. I will say to them and anybody, let the English play Hamlet and King Lear. My Shakespeare is Lonesome Dove, and Augustus McRae is my favorite part. And he was a great Texas Ranger, and I'm sure that anybody out there in the world that would like to come to this wonderful museum, please come. It is a wonderful place to have respect and awe for a great institution, the Texas Rangers. Gus and Woodrow would have really liked this place. be in the cavalry if they send me off to war well I want to be in the cavalry but I won't ride home